Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. I hope you've all had some coffee, because this is the last, or quite late in the day. Um, so I hope you're, you're awake, and that I can keep you awake for the next 90 minutes. My name is Cara Turner. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. And I'm an Agile coach. I'm the chairperson of the Scrum user group in South Africa. And I'm a rigorous tinkerer. I like to try things out and see what happens. And this talk is about the, what I've learned and discovered over the last couple of years while I've been tinkering with creativity in um, fairly normal, fairly standard software development teams, um, using the retrospective specifically. So this talk is about motivation and engagement and how uh, we can use the retrospectives to build those and team creativity. So, um, it's in three sections, and these three sections cover the mechanics of what I'm indebted to Deval for calling creating the harmonious space for which we can bring our creative thinking into work. I'm going to talk about how we generate new ideas, how our brains work. I'm going to talk about motivation at work. And then I'm going to talk about rethink the, rethinking the retrospective as a creative tool. I'm not going to talk about how to run retrospectives. So for those of you who are hoping to get that, um, there's a little bit in the third section, but it's not going to be that part of it. Similarly, creativity is a very broad subject. And your definition of it, it's like saying tasting. is different from somebody else's definition of it. So if you find you are not in the right talk, I'm a firm believer in the law of two feet, which goes, if you're not learning and you're not contributing, use your own pair of these and go somewhere where you will be because your time is precious. And I will respect that. No worries. OK. So um, you have a few moments now. I would like you to work in groups. If you're at tables or if you're in the chairs, just have a chat with the people around you about what your current understanding of a retrospective is. What are the characteristics? What does it mean to you? And we're going to have three minutes to discuss that. When three minutes are up, I'm going to stick my hand up like this. Um, and that means that the time's up. When you finish talking or you notice my hand's up, please put your hand up too, and then um, you'll be surprised how quickly that uh, sorts the room. If you want to be leaving, now is a good time. So. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? Keep playing. Pardon? Do you want me to keep I've got here, but if you if you're happy to help as well. This is three. Okay. Oh, uh, hold on. I love how that works. OK, so hopefully you, amongst your discussion, you'll have had some of these words, things like inspect and adapt, gathering data, continuous improvements, smart goals, goals of any sort, smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. There are a few variations on that. So we use retrospectives to get better at what we do. right? I'm going to start off by talking about how we generate new ideas. And because this is something that all happens in the mind, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the mind, or the brain, anyway. Some variation or some distinction. So it turns out we're all having ideas all the time. We're built like this. Some of you in the audience right now are thinking about which session you're going to go to next. Some of you are wondering about the lunch that you had earlier and deciding, well, if I tried something new, did I like it? Do I want to try something different tomorrow? And we do this all the time. This is our decision-making framework. We have an idea about something that we need to make a decision about. We go and we do it. We get some feedback, and we kind of update our existing assumptions and thinking based on that neural network. 
These kinds of ideas are not necessarily breakthrough ideas. Although the next session you go to might be breakthrough and will change things, so please do it. Um, on the whole, most of our ideas are fairly mon mundane. And why is that? So there are a few things that limit creative thinking. First off is the existing neural networks we have. So those are the process by which we make an assumption, we go, we check it out, we update, and it creates a set of connections in our brain that we call a neural network. And it's very useful for when we encounter situations that are familiar to us. So we don't have to go and work out what all the possibilities are and what are possible, what our constraints and everything are every time we do something with which we are familiar. So it helps us to be more productive and more effective. It also means that when we encounter something familiar, we kind of hop on that existing network and we don't stop and go, well, how could we do this differently? So it kind of creates the routines. And in order to change the routines we're in, we need to be able to disrupt our thinking. The other thing that affects us is the uh, experience of threat or pressure. So when we're wired that when we encounter a threat in life, our brain stops focusing on anything but the problem and how to get away from the problem. And um, apparently it's evolutionary that you encounter a wild animal and you stop looking at the patterns in the leaves, uh, you look at how to, you can get away. I suspect it's still very useful if you're in the wrong side of town. You still want to be working out how to get away from that problem. But in our work environments, Hopefully, none of our colleagues are trying to kill us, um, would be advantageous, and that we actually need to collaborate with each other to solve problems in a creative way. Unfortunately, our brain has a secondary uh, circuit with when the threat, the immediate threat is gone, we check, are we still feeling under pressure? And if we are, maintain that status quo. So if our work environment is highly stressful, we're unlikely to get out of that focus on the problem and how to get away from the problem for long enough to stop and go, well, what are my other alternatives? So the less stress you're under, the more likely it is you're going to be coming up with creative ideas. And the last thing, of course, is time. Um, how often do you have an idea that kind of, it's a bright spark, and then it disappears because we haven't, got, we haven't created a space in which to play with our ideas? And so very few of them get remembered and pulled into our working environment. Um, but we have retrospectives, right? So things that help us let go of these constraints. First off, laughter. The most valuable tool there is for getting out of that stressed environment to be able to look at different and new connections. There are three things that support that. It's novelty. Dissonance and play. Uh, novelty, our brains are wired to pay attention to anything that we see for the first time. We release dopamine at that time, and that is that happy, nice chemical you may have heard about, a feeling of loveliness, because new things offer us new opportunities, and with dopamine or that happy feeling, we can see new paths. Dissonance which literally means to sound wrong. Um, it's the opposite of harmony. Uh, dissonance is the experience we have when an idea clashes with our existing neural network, and it doesn't make sense to us. It's an uncomfortable feeling. And so we only want this for a short period of time because sustained dissonance, of course, is stress. Um, so people who are, talk about getting you out of your comfort zone, it's the dissonance part of things that they're trying to create to break that pattern. And play. So play is the activity by which we entertain new ideas. We can try out new combinations. We can experiment in a safe to fail way. Play is the way in which we all learn. It doesn't break our connections, but it helps us to make new connections. And there are two tools for that. Metaphor and imagining the future, which we're going to talk about. How can metaphor help you to have an idea? If you think about software that is buggy, and I'm sure you've all encountered a 
software system that has had bugs. And you try to compare it with a canoe. What might you get? Holes, yep. In English, there's a saying that you're up an unpleasant creek um, in a leaky canoe. The immediate association is with troubles that you're in. If you take it a little bit further, canoes are things for going on a voyage. So you might need to go on a journey to understand uh, your problem differently. Metaphor helps us to create language for things that we know instinctively, but is tacit knowledge to us. It helps to us to make it explicit, helps us to share that information with other people. What if we compare our buggy software with a UFO? What do we get then? Unknown. Pardon? Unknown. Unknown, yeah? This one is harder, right? <coughs> this one is dissonance. Were you saying something? No? Okay. So maybe you've got to look at your software as if you were giving it to aliens, that they don't, they don't read the same way you do. Maybe the whole way in which we're communicating or sending things through the pipes is following a different route. And maybe we have to travel to a completely new perspective to see our software again, to understand where the bugs are coming in. So dissonance, which doesn't quite fit our neural network, makes us force new connections, which helps us to create new options. So, metaphor is that tool. How can imagining the future help us to have an idea? So this one's a bit odd. You know the feeling at the end of the day, or maybe you're on holiday, and you put your feet up, and you chill out, and you start reflecting on how your life is going. You do some daydreaming, and what's been happening, and where you'd like to go. That set of neural connections that we use when we're daydreaming happens to be the same set of neural connections we use when we're being creative, when we're having creative ideas. So simply by daydreaming, we're exercising our creative thinking capacity. The other part of it is that when we actively choose to be uh, imagining the future, and it's not one future, of course. When we imagine it, there are many futures, many possibilities. By actively engaging with what we imagine might happen in the future, we can start to prepare for um, a great customer feedback. Well, in that case, we need a process to, from which to get it back, or a negative event. And by preparing, when we get to the future, we're going to react differently than if we were unprepared. It helps us to get out of reactive mode and into creative mode. So, visualization key skill for creative thinking, which is useful to know. Once we have an idea, we have an experience and it connects to neurons in our brain, it's quite a light connection. That can break very easily or dissolve or go somewhere else, um, which is why forgetfulness or how forgetfulness happens. By repeating that ex uh, experience, by having it over and over, that neuro neuronal connection gets stronger and thicker, and it becomes more useful that we can use in play and association. And the more we use that particular connection, the stronger it gets, and if it becomes really important to us, we get these things called myelin sheaths. We protect that network or that connection um, so that it, it's much stronger and an idea flows from one to the other much faster than through the other networks, which is how we build habits. Now remember we started off with those existing neural networks that are a limit to thinking out of the box. If your neural network includes I can think out the box, then that's a strong and healthy one to have. Okay. What happens when you have an idea and you share it? Somebody builds on it. Uh, I have an idea. I tell my friend, I've got apples. Oh, I've got a whole lot of fruit. Together we can make fruit salad. It becomes, we can make much richer um, creations than one person having an idea alone. 
innovation is what happens when we share our ideas and build on them together, and we bring our strengths together. So I'm not going to talk much more about innovation because it is a vast subject and this is a short time. To generate breakthrough ideas, we need to interrupt our existing patterns. We need to create new patterns that incorporate creative thinking. And we need to collaborate to shape and to share ideas. We have some, uh, if you want to read more about this section, these are the books I highly recommend. The slides will be on the uh, site later. They are not yet. I've been tweaking. Um, and we have three minutes now to have, if you have any questions for that, and again, if you wish to exercise the law of two feet, this is an appropriate moment. Does anybody have any questions? Pardon? Back to the book slide. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I'm going to move forward then. All right. So, we're all creative beings. And we come to work. How do we make sure that our work environment gives us the space we need to exercise our creativity? It turns out that when we get to work, the most important thing we really do is a whole lot of in complex uh, social interactions that are really soft skills. And the ingredients amongst those interactions for creative thinking are trust, and engagement and drive. And it works a bit like this. Trust is a bet about how my work will be valued. So what I believe you're going to value, and that determines what I'm prepared to share. So it turns, uh, trust is one of the things that we evaluate constantly. We reevaluate it. So if I share an idea with you this morning and I discover at lunchtime that that idea has been misused or appropriated or misrepresented, um, I'm not going to share another idea with you. Or I'm going to be very guarded about what I share and what I don't. Engagement is whether I feel valued. And that determines how much I'll collaborate. Engagement, it's a little bit like I'm going to bet my work will be valued and then I evaluate that. But engagement is about how much I want to be at work how much I want to be able to share with others, and I feel respected and I respect the people I'm with. And it determines how much I choose to collaborate. Then drive is my desire to create value, which we know we all have, right? But in a work context, it builds on top of the trust and engagement. If I don't have trust and I don't feel engaged, my drive isn't going to find an outlet in the work context. So it determines what I'm prepared to invest of myself. Who's encountered this when you go to work? Anybody seen that vibe? It is sadly all too common. And what happens here is that when the ingredients for creative thinking are missing, so there's no trust or low trust, you don't feel engaged, and you don't want to share your passion, your inspiration is sapped, and we just kind of try to get through the day. This is clock watching. But it's useful to know that if those are the factors that are causing that, we can build them. And there's been a lot of social science studies over the last 40, 50 years around trust, engagement, and drive, which I'm going to share three models now to look at what those are. We start off with trust. This is a leadership model. It comes from Ken Blanchard, and it's ABCD, which is, they're all nice acronyms which are useful to remember. Engagement is a neuroscience model. It comes from David Rock, and it's called SCARF. And DRIVE is from Daniel Pink's book, uh, DRIVE, The Surprising Truth About What Really Motivates Us. Has anybody read that book? Yeah, lovely book. It actually sums up most of the social science around this, so it's, it's a really, really nice, easy way in, easy read. And he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. <coughs> So let's look at those three quickly. Trust. 
this is what I will share. It's the basic, so we can think about it as the building blocks. We need to be able to demonstrate ability. We need to show that we are competent in the role that we have, if we're leaders, that we have deep knowledge. If we're juniors and we're new to it, that we have the ability to acquire knowledge. And we need to be believable. We need to act with integrity and say things that we mean. When we say things, one thing and mean another, trust is broken almost immediately. We need to be connected. And that means related to each other. We need to be able to relate to each other. But it also means not physically distant. So a co-located team, it's much easier to build trust. For a distributed team, and if uh, I'm sure a lot of you are working in distributed teams, you need to find ways of continually being connected in order to maintain that trust. And dependable. We need to be able to deliver on our promises. We need to be able to show up and be reliable. So it doesn't matter how much ability you have or how much integrity you have, if you're consistently unreliable, you're going to erode trust over time. But if you have ability and your team demonstrates ability, you act with integrity, you relate to each other, and you're sufficiently reliable, this is a good way to build trust. And this model is specifically designed around rebuilding bro broken trust. So if you're in an environment where trust is low, trust starts with us. So start to exercise these, and you will immediately start to build bridges. Okay? Engagement. This is the neuroscience uh, model from Dave, Dave Rock. If the first layer was the building blocks and the foundation, this is comfort. How nice of him to call it scarf. And it determines how I'll collaborate. So the things that are important here, status. I need to receive recognition for the work I'm doing in order to want to be applying myself. It doesn't need to be huge. It needs to be proportionate to the work I'm doing, but I need to receive some kind of recognition in order to want to be at work. I need certainty. I need to know the boundaries of my uh, software project, the constraints, and I also need to have some kind of reliable, um, call it a time framework. I need to know that at 9.15 is my stand-up, or 2.30, that it's consistent, that meetings happen at the same time, that they start and end on time. That level of certainty means I can give the full commitment in the space that it is available to me. I need autonomy. So certainty isn't having my work laid out for me. Autonomy is being able to choose within those very clear constraints how I'm going to go about the work I need to do. Preferably, what I'm going to do. But sometimes, if we can't choose what, we, can, we need to always be able to choose how, which is why micromanagement does not work. You will get things done. The things that you will get done do not include a happy and engaged team. So, autonomy, ability to choose. <coughs> Relatedness, it's the same as connected. It involves a certain amount of respect. I need to respect the people I work with. I need to feel that I'm valued and I need to value them. I want to be working with them. And we can do this through the work. We can connect through the work that we're doing. And fairness. Fairness is a funny one because certainly in the environment that I grew up in, you're frequently told life isn't fair. You just need to put up with that, put up or shut up. It's true, sometimes life isn't fair. But in that situation, I'm not going to bring my full self to work. You're not going to get an engaged group of people if things happen unfairly. And we all have a pretty fine-grained sense of what is fair. We don't really like blanket rules because we're all individuals. So if somebody is late for stand-up and is punished, is that okay? If somebody else is late for stand-up and isn't punished, is that okay? We evaluate this the same way as trust all the time. And when fairness is broken, trust is broken. Okay, so that's scarf. So if you're receiving recognition, 
Your constraints are clear and you can choose how you want to work. You like the people you work with and it's a fair environment. You're going to feel engaged and want to contribute. Which takes us to the point at which we w need to be able to deliver our work. So what I'll invest of myself, the best I've got for this is AMP, the battery fully juiced up and ready to go. We've got the foundation, we've got our scarf and now we're rolling. Okay. So again, this is autonomy what I choose to work on or how I choose to improve as a team, how we choose to improve as a team. Mastery. I need to be able to find within the work I'm doing the ability to get better at what it is I do. It doesn't need to be breakthrough. It needs to be a certain amount, of, a sufficient challenge for, to hook me, not too much of a challenge that it's overwhelming and not so easy that it's not actually a challenge. It has to satisfy our desire for continuous learning. And purpose. This one is always left for last, and it's ironic. It's the last one I hear, too. It should be where we start. Purpose, we can define as knowing that at least one person's life is improved by the work that we're doing. Hopefully, the more people you know are being improved, their lives, the more se uh, the greater a sense of purpose we feel. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're working for Greenpeace or even a, for a company that's providing funding to underprivileged communities. If you are, that's awesome. But perhaps you have a piece of code that is causing bugs in production. Your clients are unhappy, your team is staying up late, it, everything is awkward. If you can get to refactor that one piece that will allow your clients to ease up, happiness in the team, you can now build on the product, that is generally, or for usually, sufficient purpose to get a team fully engaged in what they're doing. Okay, so that's drive. And when you have all of those together, we have an intrinsically motivated, collaborative, and skilled team who are ripe for creativity. They might not yet have creative activities involved in their work, but they're right for it. Who works in an organization like that? One, two, three, nice, four. If you don't, how can we do that? All this nice, airy, fairy, hippie stuff. <laughs> what I'd like you to do right now, and we've got a good five minutes for this at least, is talk amongst yourselves, the same group that you use to talk about what the retrospective is, to look at how each of these elements can be generated by having regular retrospectives, as they are right now. Okay? Um, again, after five minutes, I'm going to stick my hand up like this. And um, go. I see there's lots of conversations happening amongst you guys. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so what did you get? Some, some ideas.
Transparency helps. Did you talk about how you can use the retrospective to develop transparency? Okay, nice. Somebody else? Yes? Yes, that's a nice one. Nice. Very nice. It also acts as a model for the others to follow. Thank you. Uh, and in addition to that, for the, from the dry perspective, uh, I think it's also the, uh, when we chalk out the action items for the next subsequent iterations, um, it, it also gives an avenue of identifying where our loopholes were and what we could do better. So that kind of takes us one step closer to the perfection or the mastery. So that's how we could generate the drive going forward. So what we had there was we get to tell our stories, we get to recognize each other, um, and we generate trust amongst each other. And I think I missed the third <coughs> one in recounting it. Anybody else? Something from the side of the room? Yeah. So these elements, I think, are what reiterates what we can call a self-motivating team. Some of the, these are my ideas, and they are by no means complete. There are, every time I look at this, I change the set of words. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you had something along these lines, you'll start to see how holding retrospectives that are safe places in a regular heartbeat, certainty, having a regular heartbeat uh, targets, allows us, without changing our organizational structure, without going to our managers and asking for permission to be creative, asking them to give us space. The retrospective is a space in which we can use our teams to become stronger and motivated which is lovely. I've had teams go from being in a very distrustful, very awkward position in the organization, people wanting to quit, people quitting, everybody's on fire, or everything's on fire, and people close behind, um, and slowly but surely building up pride in themselves. And the first, and that's the part of telling your story to each other and recognizing your skills. And over a while, starting to experiment with the work, and after six months to a year, feeling in a position of real strength, simply by using the retrospective on a regular basis. Okay. If you'd like to read more about this section, these are books I strongly recommend. Um, the Edward Desi is probably the least well-known amongst this lot, I think. Um, and it's quite a lot of, it, it, Daniel Pink references it in Drive. And it's a worthwhile read on its own. It's called Why We Do What We Do. Okay. So, we're all creative beings. We're coming to work and we're developing and creating an environment in which we're motivated to work. How do we make sure that we can actually exercise our creativity? Where is the space? Where is the time? I'd like to suggest that we use the retrospective. It is there for our continuous improvement. But we need to change it a little bit in order to use it as a creative tool. So before I start changing it, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. Evolution of the retrospective. So inspecting and adapting 1.0. The first time I held a retrospective, I was sent off you know, you're going to do a project retrospective now. I go Google on the net, and the internet says I should do it like this. We're doing it to learn from our experiences. We must look at what worked well, what didn't work well, 
and what ideas we have. We followed that format and we got a list of things. What does this give us? This format. Data. data. Gives us data. Anything else? Yes, it gives us some things to improve on. So we start with some elements which are very useful. It's a good place to start if you haven't been doing retrospectives before. It tells us how to, it helps us start to tell our story. What's wrong with this format? What isn't it giving us? Yep. Correct. And very often there's only one thing in the ideas column or two and they're things like next time bring food or in my case next time bring different food. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very hard. There is no mechanism in this process for understanding our work. And often if you use this over and over again we've got the same thing or everybody puts the same idea up in each of them. It's safe if you don't want to be understanding your work. So this is a useful tool if you're transitioning from not doing retrospectives to doing them, to learn to tell your stories. There's another thing that increasingly bugs me about this, and that is that it looks very much like the feedback sandwich of constructive criticism. And it goes a little bit like this. I need to give you some bad news. So I'm gonna tell you some good news, then I'm gonna tell you the bad news, and then I'm gonna cushion it with something. Huh? And that way, you're not gonna feel offended by what I'm telling you because we're not intelligent adults, right? So we all go away and we've broken a little bit of trust. So this format will perpetuate in an environment where you, there is no trust, where we can't really say that we think the problem lies somewhere else. We think there is a problem with a manager or a manager's behavior or, uh, and I mean through the system, not strange, although you never know. <laughs> Um, we can't really interact in, a, in an unsafe environment, so this format will perpetuate there. So after realizing that we need to do something more, a lot of agile thinkers around 2005, 2006 started looking at how we can use, what methods we can use to understand and collaborate uh, on the work, come together, and they looked in the field of facilitation because they've been doing that for a long time. So this format comes from facilitation, and it looks like this. We start with an opening. We start by saying this is what we're going to do, and we focus. We then have a bunch of divergent activities to choose from. And these divergent activities help us to explore the information, the insights, and generate ideas about the topic. So there are, and there are a number of activities that can fit into this, frame, uh, this section. We then follow with convergent activities. So we've generated some ideas and insights through engaging act activities. <laughs> and now we need to um, narrow the focus, find what's valuable and practical, and clarify the actions that are going out of there. And then we close and look at the retrospective and say, did that give us what we needed? How could we do that better next time? And if you are using the, how many of you are familiar with the Agile Retrospectives book by Esther Darby and Diana Larson? All right, very strongly recommend. It was printed in 2006, that's eight years ago, almost. I think it came out middle of the year. And the format that they set is to set the scene, gather data, generate insights, decide what to do, and close the retrospective. So if you're familiar with that, this is how it flows through the divergent, convergent, framework. This format has been generating insights and improving software projects for a very long time, eight years and more. The books obviously come after the ideas, right? And that has helped software to improve significantly. And there are lots of different activities. There, there's that book, there's Gene Tabaker's Collaboration Explained. There are a huge amount of resources on the internet. I think, Ellen, you said you have a site with similar things. Okay. 
and um, I've got a website that is simply a curation of other people's ideas, uh, facilitating agility, so, and that will be at the end. There's, there's a lot of information on the internet. We've been doing this for a while. It's giving us a lot of good info. After six, to, six months to a year of doing this, teams get very good at the feeling of continuous improvement, getting better at what we do. After two or three years, we've pretty much cleaned out those cobwebs, re-architected those buggy areas, got to the point where we understand our requirements so much better. We're in tune with ourselves and we know how to get on with, with each other. At this point, teams start saying, well, why are we bothering to retrospect? We had a nice sprint. Continuous improvement means getting beyond that level of good. So I'd like to suggest that one way of doing that, one way of moving beyond we've got to that level of good, is to start using the retrospective to create our stories. If the first section told us what our stories are, the second type helped us to really understand our stories and to interact with them. Now let's look at creating the stories we want to be playing in. And what I suggest for that is, of course, play. Remember how play is that activity by which we entertain new ideas and combine new things in different ways in a safe-to-fail environment, safe-to-fail environment, retrospectives? If we start to in introduce activities within the retrospective that we can play around with, Turn it into a tinkering space. And that, before we get into anything creative, if you take things from systems thinking, complexity thinking, lean, innovation, and start introducing those in the retrospective space, we're upping our level of knowledge. That alone is going to help us without feeling like we are working within our sprint and we have to get this goal right. Within the retrospective, we can just play. Another personal bugbear of mine. Why is it called a retrospective? Any ideas? That's what it means, yes? It's looking back. I suspect it's called that because Norm Kurth wrote a book called Project Retrospectives and it's stuck. <laughs> and he was looking back, so that's good. Why do we want to look back? To move forward, yes. But why do we look back? To see what went wrong so that we don't repeat it. To see what went wrong. That is a very nice description. What she said was, we're expecting in the future it will look the same as the past, so we're going to deal with that, which is the wrong assumption. Okay. We believe that's where the data is. It's the things that we can fairly reliably say are true, are in the past, because we are retrospectively coherent. But our memory's a bit funny, so we sometimes actually misremember things. I'd like to suggest, and this is something I've been doing with my teams for a while. Ooh, before I suggest that. <laughs> this is the agile principle that governs retrospectives. Um, how many of you are familiar with the principles behind the Agile Manifesto? There are 12 of them. Right, this happens to be the 12th one. It, they're not numbered, but it always comes at the end. Um, so the principle is, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Where is time in this statement? Regularly, Regularly yes, there's a heartbeat. But where does it say looking back? By, there, by the word more effective, is it saying looking back? Reflect, reflect. So let's think about reflect. What does that tell us? Possibly the present, if we look in a mirror. We can see what data we have around us. But at the end of the day, when we're in that daydreaming space, we're reflecting on our lives. It's past, present, and future. When we're being creative, there is no sense of time. 
because I'd like to suggest what if we make the future our focus? Okay? If we stop looking back, in the West, the left is the past. We stop looking back at the problems that we've had and the things we're trying to get away from and start looking to the future where our possibilities lie, where our options lie, where we can start putting in place plans to hold off the troubles we imagine, to get us stronger there, and to put in place skills and practices that will help us maximize and leverage the opportunities we believe are there. So what would that look like? I have a small, medium, and large. Um, the simple would be not too much of a mind bend, a little bit of a mind bend, and let's get creative. So the first off is make your bets explicit. You know how we write goals at the end of each retrospective and we kind of say, we hope we're going to do this? It's a little bet. We bet that if we make this improvement or we do this action, we will receive this benefit. Let's make it explicit. So write a goal hypothesis. How many of you were in Jez's talk just before this one? Right? He's also talking about hypotheses. Write a goal hypothesis. By implementing our goal, for example, writing a test harness, we expect this result. We expect to catch bugs earlier. We expect to catch them before we release them, in fact. What we'll see if we're right, so those are the past conditions, and what we'll see if we're wrong, the fail. If we're right, then when we write the test har harness, we will probably be fixing more bugs in sprint. It will probably take us a little bit longer. On the other hand, we'll probably have a happy, te uh, happy client. Where did that one come from? Um, and if we're wrong, well, we will have built a test harness, but perhaps the bugs are coming in from a different place than where we tested. Maybe it's data coming through a different pipe. And maybe our client continues to be unhappy at that point. Okay? This is visualizing what will happen if we implement our goal. It's looking into the future to imagine what it looks like. And the best part is this is science. So the engineers amongst you who are suspicious about creative stuff can go back to your teams and say, this is the scientific method. We can do it. It's OK. So first level, make your bets explicit. Write the whole uh, goal hypothesis. The next level is to actively imagine the future. Remember that how imagining that future is creative in itself. And there are two specific exercises around this, which have been doing the rounds for a while. The one is to imagine you get to the end of your sprint or the end of your release, and the most wonderful thing has happened. It's the best project you have ever in, uh, been on. The customer was happy. There were happy coincidences. We had the right skills at the right time. What did that look like? What were the happy coincidences? Similarly, you get to the end of the sprint or your retrospective and everything went wrong. It was oh, hellfire. We, we never want to be there again. Everything is burning. What happened? What did that look like? So we first off, and remember, if you're going to do this, first off, don't do those together. Don't remember that? I haven't told you. Don't do them together. But remember that positive thinking is hard when you've already started thinking negatively. So don't do them together, but try to do the positive one first because the negative one is going to shut down our thinking about alternate solutions. It will help us focus on problem solutions. So the questions for each of these are, what could we do to make this happen in each of them? How could we make sure we have serendipitous connections? You're kidding me, Cara. We can't predict the future, but we can imagine it. And once we've imagined it, we can handle what we imagine. Similarly, what would have happened, what would we have done in order for us to have everything on fire? We didn't write a test harness. Ah, check, let's write a test harness. How can we prepare? What are the steps we need to put in place to make sure that we can leverage the opportunities and take care of the risks that we're facing so that when we get there, our future is different than it would have been if we hadn't thought about it? 
Just by doing this, our future is different already. And then if we get there and it happens, we're ready to act. Or if we get there and something else happens, I would say 75% chance you'll get there and something else has happened because you prepared in the first place and because we can't predict the future. We're already in the framework of thinking, how do we handle this problem? So we can act very creatively and very res responsively. This is what builds team resilience. Okay. Any questions on this one? Okay, anybody tried these exercises? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, small group. Then, mark three, getting really creative. If we start to introduce in our retrospective processes, our retrospective format, the ideating process, we start to generate ideas that didn't exist before. How do we do that? We need a slightly different framework for that. So I'm calling it a creative thinking format. And it follows the same sort of structure. We need to start with an opening. Then for our divergent exercise, we need, uh, we will be ideating. This is generating new ideas that you hadn't had before you started ideating. At that point, it's too early to go straight into convergence. We need to have a small selection criteria by which we pick the best of the ideas. We're not ready to converge, but we can pick them according to uh, most possibility or what we most have most passion about. And then follow a second divergent activity that is an elaboration of the ideas that we've picked. Followed by a convergence which is evaluating what we are, uh, the ideas that we've Gen generated and then a close again review how we are uh, how that process worked for us and how we can improve so what does that look like these are some of the activities that you can put inside this I like to use improv as the opening exercise it's a nice way of loosening up the mind improv exercises for the ideating phase these are three ideas there's idea tunes false faces, and forced connections. These ideas come from Thinker Toys and from Edward de Bono's How to Have Creative Ideas. And I'm going to walk you through some, one of each of these, followed by ways in which we can elaborate. Body storming is an elaboration process. Prototyping is an elaboration process. Something like a graphic plan, you might want to put lean canvas in here. We're trying to get more data about what we're doing. Followed by an evaluation process, ritual descent, feasibility, this is Idio's way of looking at it, and another one called safe bold, so that's a checklist or some criteria that we weigh up against, followed by a review. So I'm going to walk you through these ones. Improv. Um, so, what I like about improv is that they're based around stories. And the thinking behind it is accept and build. Is anybody here familiar with the improv exercise, yes and? A few of you? Okay. So, what happens there is one person starts a conversation and the next person may not reject. You have to accept. So, you can't say, well, no, that's ridiculous. Yes and build on that. So one of the ways of doing that, you can do that simply as a conversation. You can have somebody just go around the team a couple of times building on that, and you can follow it with yes, but, and see the difference, because yes, but, you can feel really how a negative negativity leads you to um, smaller stories. What you can do is take a set of words. Uh, I've printed these out of the um, Sinker Toys books. They're already association-rich words, and each of the team members gets a word, and they start a sentence with their word. The next person follows with yes, and there was a flamingo. Yes, and it was giving a politician 
uh, so the flamingo in, in the city. It was giving the politician a lot of trouble. Yes, and that was because he kept ringing the doorbell. Yes, and the landlord was getting, and this gets really silly really fast. Do you remember that thing about laughter? Everybody relaxes. It's a lot of fun. Um, initially, there are skeptics. I promise you three times you've done this and I've only had one person in all the teams I've ever worked with still reject the idea. We like these. Another option is improv drawing. So if you take a little piece of paper that just has a line on it, a squiggle, and give it to the team members and ask them to draw something. Sometimes I frame it. What was the last sprint like? You can see there was a lot of variety in this feedback. An A plus and a hanged man. And we started talking about different perspectives. But this comes from something called the Torrance Framework for Creativity. It's a Torrance test. I'm not sure how I feel. In fact, I'm very clear about how I feel about testing creativity. Nonetheless, I think this is useful. Um, that you just give it to people and you don't give them a framework and see what they come up with. It's useful to have something to start with, a point of reference. If you give people a blank paper, it's hard for them to focus. All right, so ideating is the space where we generate ideas we've never had before. And so there's, I'm going to talk through idea tunes, and I do have time to talk through the false faces one as well. Forced connection is another one. You can Google these. They are out there. You can get the books. They are lovely. And you will make the authors happier. Um, I'm not one of them. So, idea tunes. You start by stating the challenge. We always, when we start ideating, need to have some frame of reference. We need to have a focus. State the challenge clearly. Then this one goes, then we list the attributes of that challenge and draw symbols that represent those attributes and then experiment with a combination of the symbols. So this particular exercise I did with a team simply as a creative thinking exercise. So this wasn't to solve a specific problem, it's to learn how to get to generating ideas. So the challenge was we need more ice cream. The attributes that the team came up with were hungry, sweet, delivery, urgency, love, packaging, and cold. So you've got need, ice cream, etc. The images that came with that, so you can see hungry, sweet, delivery, urgency, love, packaging, and cold. If I didn't have the words there, they probably wouldn't mean anything to you, so you write them on the back. And then you experiment with combinations. You pull the words around, uh, the ideas around. And we had delivery and love. Send ice cream to a loved one. An ice cream delivery service. Okay? Sweet, cold, and packaging. The words verbatim were sweet mix that you mix and freeze instantly. Instant ice cream. So these were ideas that had not occurred to anybody before we did the opening exercise, even after the opening exercise. What's wonderful about this sort of exercise is it generates in people the belief that they can, each of them individually, have creative ideas, which is knocked out of us when we're children, which I do not understand and sure is wrong. We can bring it back, okay? Rah, rah. <laughs> so, I don't have pictures for this one, so it's a little bit more boring. This is one that the, a very ordinary team faced. So the challenge is, and I apologize for the small writing for the people at the back. Um, so the challenge is that the client reprioritizes, then loses touch with planning. Anybody had this problem before? <laughs> okay. List the assumptions. Well, we had about five. I'm giving you these two. Prioritizing new work delays planned work. We assume that when we prioritize new work, the planned work gets pushed down the pipe. We also assume that we send a build twice per sprint. This team is working on a desktop application, so it's not a web application, for a client who would then distribute it. Um, so we now the next step is to reverse, write in the negative the assumptions. Very literally write in the negative. So don't try and reword it. We don't send a build twice per sprint. 
how could the reverse, how could the will be different in order for the reverse to be true? Well, I suppose we could, and this, this part takes a little bit of time, a little bit of wrapping your head around. We could only send one bill per sprint. Then that would fill that. We could send multiple bills per sprint. We could spend, send many. This, we have generated ideas across all of these. This one I'm showing you uh, because it really is breakthrough for this team. They cannot, the client has no capacity to build, on, uh, build from their side. It's never been considered in the team, but we've been doing enough creative thinking for the guys to go, oh, outside the box, something like um, having Smarties delivered on your lawn. I was using them the example. Something completely outside of this world. So outside of their world was the ability for the client to upload, uh, build on demand, if we just upload changes to a central server. We couldn't act on this one. It didn't matter. Because what happened along the way is we, firstly we've generated the idea, it is now simmering within the team. But we also surfaced another hidden assumption and that was that our sprint length is three weeks. But if we change our sprint lengths, and send one build per sprint, then we have a much better control over what the client is expecting. Now this that might not feel to any of you like it's breakthrough thinking. The difference being that when I started working with a the team, they were very full of the things they couldn't do. They can't do this because the client says that, and the client wants two builds per week, and we've made all sorts of adjustments around what the client wants and now they are confident and comfortable and when we fed back to the client they're like, oh, well if that's why you want it, we can change that. It made a difference and it gave the team an enormous sense of pride. Okay. Any questions about this one before I move on? Okay. So in elaboration techniques, this is where we try the ideas out. And I'm going to talk through body storming, prototyping, graphic game plan, lean canvas, we'll fill in here. You can kind of go, all right, well, what do we need in order to fill those sections? Body storming looks a little bit like this. In fact, it looks a lot like this. Has anybody heard of body storming here or tried it out? Okay, this is a lot of fun. This generates laughter. What we do is, it's called, for the smart people, smart word, when you want to sell it to the bosses, experiential prototyping. That is something that makes sense retrospectively and it makes no sense initially. What you do is you act out an interaction with the product. Body storming is often described as a brainstorming activity. It's not really. Brainstorming is generating ideas that weren't there before. Body storming is validating, I've got an idea, how do I want, what would that look like? Well, I need a page that scrolls, and then you get somebody going, okay, well, I'm scrolling for you. Oh, I need more information, scroll it up. Oh, there's an assumption that there's more information underneath, and it's radically silly. What it does as you go along is it surfaces tacit assumptions. Things that we would kind of go, of course we need this data, but we don't think about where it might go. And we capture them on a whiteboard or a flip chart very quickly as we go. So this one is for a mobile gateway, um, not gateway, a mobile payment process that you could use while driving around the countryside. And as we went along, we realized we had to think about what about refunds? Do we need Wi-Fi connections? Are there transaction fees? And you can see towards the bottom, towards the end, we're getting like really excited and writing things down and running back and trying them out again. We go step through, it works a lot like a customer experience journey. We step through and by a half hour exercise, have a very clear visual idea about what that idea might look like and what we need to do to put that in place. A good elaboration technique will help you clear up what the important questions are, what the obvious ones are, and what do we still need to know, and if that makes it a valid idea or not. 
which then allows us to evaluate this in a good way. So there are various formats for evaluating. The IDEO format, I'll show you, safe, bold as well. Ritual, descent, and play the critic I want to talk about after I've shown you. The IDEO format is very simple. It ranks in a Venn diagram, your product desirability, the technical feasibility, and the business viability. You can see this group were very optimistic about all their ideas. They were all technically feasible. Um, so it might need another layer of evaluation after this. But you kind of place, well, if this one, if these ones don't really have business viability, let's not look at them first. Let's focus, and it's a good reduction technique. Safe bold is a, it's a checklist type. So down the left-hand side is safe, and down the right, which is, and down the right is bold. Each level is scaled. Um, how much work it will, or how, how much we know about it. Innovation and difficulty. So there's small, big, achievable, outperforming, oh, I'm sorry, following, leading edge, and so on. So these checklists, there are multiple checklists that you can use, but this is a nice format to rank Right, from this, I know whether I want a more innovative, but it's more difficult. Well, then it has a certain set of constraints we need to focus on. It's less innovative, but it's quicker to market. It's got different constraints we need to focus on. So it's an evaluation technique. Things, uh, ritual descent is an activity that looks at playing the critic, at taking an idea and saying, okay, what's wrong with it? In any brainstorming technique, you want to leave this right to the end and use the format, it's Dave Snowden's format, of moving from table to table anonymously. So the idea is the thing that is addressed, not the person. Criticism is something that we take very personally and it stops us thinking. It creates a threat response in us. But when you remove the criticism from a person and focus on what's wrong with this idea, we can really build on solving what's wrong and get better ideas. So this would be a good exercise to do to validate something before you bring it into the lean canvas, I think. Okay. So that's the creative thinking format. We open, ideate, select, validate, evaluate, and review. Retrospective 3.0, they focus on play, rather than problems. They focus on future rather than the past, and they focus on ideating rather than analyzing. <coughs> to read more, these are the books I strongly recommend. Again, they will be up. Does anybody have any questions? We have Plenty of time for some questions. I'm going to let you think about that because I'm sure there are one or two as I go through. Teams who think creatively, they have a pl practical play structure. And what's important about play, we can call it tinkering and we can call it play when we don't have to pretend we're serious about our work when we know we're serious about our work and we know we need to be creative in order to get the work done and not be serious about ourselves. Now, in a motivating environment that supports creative thinking, with these three elements in play, creative teams create their own futures. I'd like to give a special thanks to Liz Linda Rising whose talks last year at this conference were really inspirational for me and got me working on the talk. Her book is Fearless Change, Patterns for Introducing New Ideas. So I strongly recommend that one. Okay. So I'll leave you with that one last thought and my references. Questions? Yes.
So what I do in the retrospectives is I mix up the activities. I very seldom do the full one end to end. And I'll focus on where I think the team needs to kind of exercise that type of thinking. Sometimes we'll spend longer on the validating process, and sometimes we'll spend longer on the ideating process. Is that what you're asking me? Oh, I see. No, not really. It's, so every team is unique and every sprint is unique. So based on the sprint that's happened, I'll work in an activity. Obviously, I'm not going to repeat the same one over and over. I don't think I've ever repeated a retrospective in my life. Sometimes I repeat the patterns. All right. Yes. Yes, that's happened. Where would you start? It depends on where the team is. Yeah, okay. But I don't, I'm not light-hearted, I'm, I'm, I'm not gentle in the introduction of like slowly pussyfooting my way in. Um, a couple of the, I, I generally start with the opening exercise because then we can get into the analysis quickly and people feel okay about it. But we've started the idea, seeded the idea that we're going to get creative and when we get creative in later exercises, it's familiar to them. Um, but people are much stronger than you think. And people have a much greater desire to exercise their creativity than we give them credit for. And it's, it's kind of worked out of us. There's a fear barrier. And I have found that once you cross that fear barrier by being somebody who's facilitating this in a retrospective, which you kind of need to be at, but you also need to want to be at, that barrier is much e more easily broken. Anything else? Yes. Uh, I have been conducting retrospectives for my team since one year now. Okay. And uh, we started off when initially the team was coming up with more pain areas and we used to come up with experiments to get over those areas. Right. Uh, but now we have reached a point where like we use sticky notes, green is for positive, red is for negative. So now it's dominated by green. So it, it motivates the team, but then they stop thinking beyond what, how we can improve ourselves. And uh, as I'm, I'm playing role of a scrum master in the team, I do not try to influence them a lot. I want them to find out the problems and them to come up with the solutions and experiments. Yes. So many a times we reach a point where there is hardly any red sticky on the board and then we don't have a purpose for the meeting. Oh no, there's nothing to fix. Yes. So, <laughs> but, but, but I know that there are a few areas over there, but I do not want to push, the, push them right. onto them. So. so what's nice about that second format, the um, process of generating insights, gathering data, are you using that, the Agile Retrospectives format? So uh, yeah, we are using something like that. It's not it's similar to that, but... Do you repeat exactly the same retrospective each yes. time? Play. Use the retrospective to... If you feel that the... So first off, sometimes when there's a problem with a team that you can see clearly from the outside, like a three-week sprint is usually an anti-pattern. If you tell the team, go to two weeks, it's not their idea and they haven't bought in. And it's because there's something else. It's a symptom. The thing that you can see from the outside is a symptom. And there are other problems that the team knows. So you can't tell them, this is your problem, go and fix it. You can an analyze and get inside what all is going on and find the little pieces one by one by which you go, okay, well, maybe that's the thing. And if you use thinking from different, I mean, the wonderful thing about a software development is it is incredibly interesting. Lots of people have written lots of things from different perspectives. There are many ways to look at our work. So if you take things that come out of lean or systems thinking or innovation thinking and you build those into the retrospective so that you give teams a working knowledge of it, 
It's like a training course, but without them knowing about it or planning or having any attachment or fear about it. Get involved with the work. That will surface. So if you have an idea where a problem you think is, you can build the retrospective in that direction, but the team is still going to know what the right thing to address is. So are you also suggesting we should try out different retrospective techniques even? Because, yes. Because I've seen that copies are getting bored of that same style. Yes, well, yes. definitely. They were really excited about it in the beginning because it was something new for them. But Remember how the point where, mm, no, it's the same thing. Novelty is a thing that we pay attention to and we like. Novelty is lovely. Keep trying new things. Okay. And the more you try new things, the more you have to stretch yourself which is lovely, too. Anything else before I wrap up? Yes. Would you recommend one of these format calls to try to get it done in one of the Yes. So I can't answer that question from personal experience because I started with the like, don't like ideas. And for me, it worked as a bridge from never looking back to working out what the data was. I wouldn't go deeply creative initially because the team is so aware of the problems. I don't think I've ever walked into a team that is very aware of everything that's right. They're very aware of what's wrong, and if you take the space which is supposed to be able for them to use, to improve, and you do something else, I suspect you will lose trust because they need to fix these issues. But every team is special and different, so it's, it, you would need to use your intuition around that. I don't believe in hard and fast rules. They're, they're troublesome. <laughs> All right. So, oh, one more question. Well, I find that introducing things like improv in the beginning, it really weirds people out at first. Why are we doing this strange thing? Just by seeding the creative thinking format, gets them to start, there's a little bit of laughter, there's a little bit of discomfort, and then the next time there's a little bit more laughter. So for teams where there's a huge amount of anxiety, you actually have to address that anxiety in order to hold their trust. But at the same time, you can introduce them to alternatives. So things like a false faces exercise that allows the team to pick what's wrong and then turn it around and then focus on ideating around that is incredibly useful because they still have, the, it reduces the anxiety that they're not going to address the trouble. And it starts to access their ability to think out the box. Does that help you? Okay. I'd like to thank you all for staying, for being part of the talk. Thank you.